grain weighs about three and a half pounds, uh, which is not very much for a 150 pound <laughs> typical human. But because of its high metabolism, it gets 40% of the blood volume circulating at any time. Hold the tray. Right? Yeah, come on, you're a ball Does the next person hold the tray while she holds it? You can figure this out. And don't keep moving it. Oh my god. That's like really cool. It's, like it's different than the model. Okay, yeah. Oh my it's goodness. <laughs> as I live and breathe from the ball of the house. As, as most of you know, the left side of the brain controls the side of the body. Like, except for the cerebellum, balance which controls its own side. These are called gyri, the spaces in between are called sulci. The reason the brain, the higher up you go in the evolutionary tree, the more convolutions the brain is, because the more convolutions, the more surface area you can put in small volumes. And as brains become more sophisticated, they need more room to store more information. One of the things interesting about the brain is that if you look under the microscope at any part of the brain that you picked, you'd be able to tell whether it's gray matter, which is where the neurons and the nerve cells are, or white matter, where the axons are. Everything that happens in the brain happens because of electricity and biochemistry. That's it. There's nothing special about the cells and the motor cortex that control your movement, speech cortex, auditory cortex, visual cortex, limbic system, um, areas controlling the membrane. It all looks the same under the microscope. It's the connections that are pre-wired in the brain that let things do what they're supposed to do. And they're the connections that develop over time because of new things that you learn, skills, um, language, general knowledge, it all gets stored somewhere in the brain. This is um, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, the temporal lobes, occipital lobe, cerebellum, and the brain stem. The blood vessels that supply the brain are located at the base of the brain. Some of you or all of you probably have heard um, about brain aneurysms, mm -hmm. which are little blood vessel bubbles that form the blood vessels of the vein. Usually the blood vessel at the base of the brain. The blood vessels are small. Aneurysms are usually very small, six, seven, eight millimeters, and sometimes less, and uh, can be devastating when they bleed. Similarly, these blood vessels are not very big, but if some of the major vessels uh, get filled with clot or they're occluded because of arterial sclerotic disease, uh, a small degree of obstruction can give you a very large stroke in the brain. Brain cells do not regrow. The neurons you get when you're born, when you come to the factory, all the neurons you're going to get. Axons will not regrow either. That's why the nervous system is so unforgiving. Extraordinarily sensitive to oxygen deprivation and deprivation of glucose, which is why so much blood goes to the brain. 20% of the circulating blood volume at any one time is in the brain. The brain only weighs about 3 pounds, so if you weigh between 120 and 150 pounds, the brain disproportionately gets more than its share of blood because it does not store oxygen or glucose. And oxygen and glucose lack will be perceived by the brain uh, in a negative way in a very, very short period of time. Oxygen deprivation will cause you to lose consciousness, usually 45 seconds to a minute, uh, sometimes a little bit more. Uh, glucose deprivation and oxygen deprivation beyond the two to three minute mark will give you brain damage. If you get a stroke in what's called the anterior cerebral artery, which goes up to here, this is the leg cortex, so you get leg only. If you get the middle cerebral artery, but not the anterior cerebral artery, you'll knock off all this, and you'll tend to get face, arm, and it's the dominant hemisphere speech. Now, there are other places where you can do that with major stroke syndromes. You can lose one, you can lose face alone, arm alone, leg alone, face and arm, face, arm, and speech, face, arm, leg, but not speech. Depends on which blood vessel is affected and which area of the brain it supplies. This is the 
cut half of the medial surface of the brain. There are a few <laughs> holes in the center of the brain. They're called ventricles, kind of like ventricles in the heart, cavities that contain fluid. This is called the choroid plexus. Now what the choroid plexus does is make spinal fluid. Spinal fluid circulates in the brain and does two things. It cleans the brain from the inside out and it lets the brain float inside the skull. The brain did not float. Every time you cough, you'd injure your brain. There's, there's a ventricle on each side, each hemisphere. There's also one right in the middle underneath this. this these are the lateral ventricles because they're on the lateral side of the brain. This is the third ventricle because the one inside the cerebellum, which we'll see in a minute, is the fourth ventricle. They all communicate, but if they don't, if they get blocked up by a tumor or a blood clot or pus if somebody has an infection in the brain or swelling in the brain that obstructs the flow, the fluid cavities will get bigger. That's called hydrocephalus, and that's a condition that needs to be treated. Um, so that's the fluid cavities. Now, there's this pink structure that you see here, which is the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum connects the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere. And it's important that the brain, each side of the brain knows what the other side of the brain is doing. Otherwise, things that... If I showed you something in your right optic app or right, op, right visual field and asked you to tell me what it was, if the connections from the corpus callosum to the left side of the brain where speech resides were cut, you'd know what it was, but you wouldn't be able to tell me what it was because what it was would not get to the other side of the brain. The gyrus on the right side of the brain. This has to do with things such as reading, rising, writing, appreciation of music. There are people who have conditions where music has no meaning. That's atonal, which would be really depressing for me. I love music. I couldn't appreciate music anyway. That'd be, that'd be a big, I, my life would lose a lot of its riches, as I suspect yours would too. Reading and writing cortices are represented here. What's interesting, there are conditions where people can write, but they can't read what they've written. Like if I said, if I dictated to somebody, um, today is Tuesday, April 12, 2011, they could write that. And then if I later gave that to them to read, even though they wrote it, they couldn't read what they wrote. That's called alexia without a graphia. And then there are people who can read but can't write. All kinds of bizarre but medically explicable conditions that occur from damage to very, very focal specific parts of the brain. Your friend the cerebellum. <laughs> Studies done with, with, with monkeys who did not give consent, um, and I'm a big anti-animal experimenter, as a, even as a neurosurgeon. If you were born without a cerebellum, or if you had trauma to your cerebellum, or if some researcher thought it would be cool to see what would happen if you were a one-year-old monkey and they took out your cerebellum, uh, you're right. Up to the age of two, you can compensate without a cerebellum. Um, we see people who were born without a good chunk of their brain, just because of the way the brain developed, who have no neurologic symptoms at all, up to a point. It is easier to be born without a part of your brain for which you can adapt and accommodate than to lose a part of your brain that you can use. So other things to look at. When we cut the brain this way, what you can see is differentiation in color in the brain. White matter and gray matter. The gray matter is where the neurons are. That's where all the messages start. The white matter is what gets that electrical information from one part of the brain to the other. Now, the corpus callosum that I showed you here is the biggest fiber pathway to go from left to right. There's another one here, the phallus, but it's not nearly as important. If you look at the cut surface of the brain, there's white matter that actually connects this gyrus to the adjacent one, and on and on and on. These all share information, not just left to right, but front to back, which I'll show you in a minute, and from one area of the brain to the next. Here's an example. At the motor cortex, the sensory cortex gets an impulse, you just burn your hand. 
somehow the motor cortex, which is his next door neighbor, needs to be aware of that before you're hand away. And one of the ways it knows that is because the sensory impulses fire when they're activated to the motor cortex next door, which then, excuse me, fires to your front below to let you say, ouch. And before you've even done that, make the appropriate defensive movements to get your hand away before you even know what happened. Which is why sometimes you can stub your toe, you can burn yourself, you can step on a nail or a tack and have the appropriate evolutionarily advantageous defensive action before you're even aware that it hurts. Okay. Uh, this is the part of the brain called the thalamus. Primary sensory, auditory, and visual relays, right here. The eye nerves and the hearing nerves, come into the, their impulses come into the brain. They end up going to the thalamus, from which, through all these white matter fibers, they get distributed to where they need to be received to do whatever is required. This long band of white matter, called the arcuate fasciculus, which means arc, no surprise, is what carries electrical impulses from front to back and back to front. So the connections that go from one gyrus to the next, connections that let you go side to side, and connections that let you go front to back. There are billions of electrical connections made in the brain um, that let us do all the kinds of things that we do. Under the microscope, if you took a piece of cortex from almost anywhere, not anywhere, the motor cortex is an exception. Their neurons are a little bit different. But from any other part of gray matter in the brain, all the neurons look the same. If you took a piece of white matter, put it under a microscope, and you looked at the white, the axons, uh, and the real supporting cells of the brain, you'd have no idea from which part of the brain they came. This is the fourth ventricle, which I was speaking before. It's this little cavity. And I'm going to pass around the cerebellum. It's not too gloppy. If you look at the cerebellum, you can see gray matter and white matter, but it looks different. It looks different than the gray matter and the white matter in the cortex. The infoldings of the cerebellum are called folia because they, to early in atoms, look like leaves. But gray matter and white matter do the same thing in the cerebellum. It just looks a little different. Just as your lives will probably thrive and prosper based on connections you make with your friends and your professional colleagues and all of that, that's how the brain works on connections that it makes with its neighboring neurons and axons. And very little of this, except the potential, is pre-wired. Which is our psychology class. We learned about um, this scientist who was doing ex an experiment to see where epilepsy was located, like if somebody had it. And when he was doing it, he was probing the brain and people would just shout out memories. So does that mean that like, memories are, 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 are like, chemically, like chemical? <coughs> Well, memories are chemically embedded into your brain. That's what memories are. RNA synthetic processes that deposit chemical messages. This notion that memories might not just be biochemical, but might maybe structurally embedded somewhere in the brain, um, and then potentially could be tapped with some process to access that. Epilepsy, since you brought up epilepsy, is just um, parts of the brain being uh, in an overexcited state to which electrical activity becomes uncontrolled. So you can have epilepsy where people fall off and break their tongue and shake their arms and legs, but they have other kinds of epilepsy, a penny epilepsy, epilepsy is under an absence attack where you sit, kind of blank out, and Dr. Dorfman is not sure where they're going to like zoning out while she's talking, or <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, she's still here. <laughs> you can have something called partial complex epilepsy, which comes from the temporal lobe, as much epilepsy does, um, and partial complex seizures are usually um, stereotypical activities in a given patient. They might be an arm wave or uh, a head twitch or something like that, or something more violent. If you have a brain injury and like the motor cortex gets a scar, that scar can be a focus from which electrical activity will develop and spread uncontrollably. 
and it gives you a seizure. Now, there are surgical treatments for epilepsy. Partial complex seizures that come from the temporal lobe, called temporal lobe epilepsy, frequently will respond if you remove the focus where the epilepsy is originating. And now with functional MRI, you can induce a seizure or monitor somebody in the hopes of capture a seizure and then anatomically figure out where the temporal lobe damages and try to remove it. That's easier than some